I made everything but. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like me, 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 me. I don't want to know what you didn't make. Don't feel like you have to disclose that right away. Like focus on what you did make. And I'll ask like, as a judge, if I see someone comes in with a cool prop and they don't talk about the prop in a pre-judging session, I might ask like, hey, what's the deal with that prop? And then they might say like, oh, I didn't talk about this because I had a commission. And they're like, oh, okay. And then as a judge, I'm like, okay, I won't, I won't look at it, I won't care. But if that person walked in and was like, oh, I made everything, but I didn't make this. Let me show you this prop. It, it gives it gives judges something to focus on, and you never want to give a judge something to focus on that's negative. You never want to um, say like, "Well, I would have," because that's another thing that comes up an awful lot. It is like the well, I wanted it to be like this, but then I, I'm like, whoa, I'm not, I'm not a priest. I'm not here for a confession. Don't tell me what you wanted it to be because I don't know like what you wanted it to be. Maybe I, the costume that you wound up coming up with was beautiful and fantastic. But as soon as you told me that it wasn't what you liked or that I want folks here to learn from my fail because I know for a fact, I spoke with judges at this temple con many years ago, like afterwards they told me, hey, you did pretty good. Let me maybe make a suggestion. And it changed my life, it really did in the sense that it made me realize that when I present myself as a, as a costumer and as an artist, I really want to present myself in the best way possible. So let's talk about, so you're going to cosplay at a costume contest. I know a lot of folks will start with, I have a costume and this convention has a costume contest. What of my already existing things do I want to enter? And I know plenty of cosplayers who start with, there's this cost uh, this convention coming up and there's a costume contest and I want to make something that's going to kill at that costume contest. And you get like kind of both sides. And I don't think there's any one better than the other. I think if you're going to make costumes, you should prioritize making them for the reasons that make you feel good. If making them strictly to compete is the reason why you make costumes, fine. Who am I to tell you that's a bad idea? But I do want folks to remember that cosplay competitions, like with any hobby, should be treated as, you know, with the levity that it is, because I don't want anyone to feel like they need to, um, I don't want anyone to feel like they need to do something amazing in order to enter a costume contest. It's not how it is. Anyway, when you are choosing which costume you want to enter into a competition, I like to think of it as like different things to keep an eye out for based on how my experience as a judge has gone and how my experience with other judges have, have gone. You are looking to showcase, if you've used an unusual material, that's an awesome costume to bring to a con uh, competition. Do you have impeccable implementation? That's an awesome costume to bring to a competition. Are you a jack of all trades? That's an awesome costume to bring to a competition. And it's kind of like keeping those in mind will help frame your work when you go to present it. So in our first image, my unusual material image, um, that is a costume I've entered into a competition where I used um, European tooling leather, which is a high quality leather to make the armor. And in costume contests or cosplay contests, that, that tends to be a more unusual material because a lot of folks tend to make their armor out of foam or some sort of thermoplastic like Warbra Warbla or Sintra. So that I used leather made it unusual. And that showcases an unusual skill that maybe cosplay judges haven't seen before. 
Um, similarly, like uh, in the, our middle image, the impeccable implementation, like I know I focus a lot on fiber arts. I like to sew and that tends to be the area that I'm the most comfortable and the most, uh, that's where I have the most, um, any like any sort of talent or basis is it tends to be in the fiber arts. So when I work on something that is very precise and technical, like I've got a fully boned corset in there and you know, I've got, I've got 50 yards of tool all stuffed into that skirt and I, in handmade petticoats, like that would be an example of impeccable implementation where you've really worked hard using a single skill set. Um, the people who do a lot of um, foam armor, where they're doing, where it's a lot of the same thing. Uh, so like if you're doing a full armor build, like one of those like uh, uh, World of Warcraft armor builds and you're doing like a lot with foam work, you can have amazing work, but you're really just focusing on the same skill just applied in very unique ways that would be a perfect example of that impeccable implementation as being what your core focus of your costume is. And then finally, and this is the one that tends to do really well for me when I am a judge, uh, the Jack of all trades costume. That's a costume that in integrates a variety of different like skill sets. Did you do 3D printing and resin casting and a little bit of sewing and a little bit of prop work and a little bit of armor build. Like, did you put all those things together as a single person? Fantastic. And for me as a judge, that's, those tend to be my favorite costumes because someone who shows amazing proficiency in a single domain, I value and think that they are the bee's knees, the alpha and the omega, but people who show that they are very proficient, even if they're not top tier, if they show that they're really strong in sewing and armor work and they do 3D printing too, like they are on 3D designs, like holy moly, that shows a lot of skill. And so that is another kind of costume that you might think, oh, this will be something that I should enter. So once you've kind of like figured out what you want to enter now you got to figure out what level you're going to enter your costume into the competition as now you guys get to see some embarrassing social napalm this is an early cosplay i did um i'm rapunzel from tangled like i think this was the year the movie came out uh, my wig work is somewhat atrocious. Uh, I felt good about sewing, but clearly it's not that great. I mean, it's, it's okay. Uh, this is my example, but it's not the be all end all. The first level of any costume contest is that beginner or novice level. And that would be for someone who's never entered a costume contest before. Usually it's somebody who's got like one or two years of experience. Um, someone who certainly never won a costume contest before might be in this level. This level may also be reserved for like a youth division. Um, and it might also be like a level where you worked on the costume, but if like, especially if you're on the younger end, you worked on the costume, but you got like significant assistance from a parent or you know someone else helped you along with it, that might be, um, that might still make you a beginner or novice. Now, the reason why I indicate like never entered a costume contest before is because some conventions uh, have competitions where if you have done zero costume competitions, regardless of your experience level, you're a beginner novice to them. I don't emotionally agree with that decision because I think that there are some people who have been sewing for years and years and years and years and they only just started getting into cosplay or they only just started going to conventions or only just started getting into competitions. And I always feel like that somewhat invalidates or is made to invalidate their experience. I promise you, 
in those competitions, judges are very aware when someone steps in who is has entered the novice division only because they've never done a costume contest before and they come in with an amazing costume and a wealth of experience, us as judges always retain the right to elevate somebody's category because sometimes it's just not fair that they had to follow that stupid rule despite the fact that they have like 28 years of sewing experience, you know, like that's, that would be a situation where a cosplay judge might say like, I know that they're a beginner novice, but like, let's bump them to the next category and we'll rate them accordingly because there's no way that that person is a beginner novice and it's just an insult to their skills as well as like kind of awful to the other beginner novices who actually own are beginner novices. Like you want to judge somebody relative to their same experienced peers. And if you have like someone who's actually a master seamstress or master armor builder in a beginning category, it just feels unfair. So us as judges, we do balance that out. The next category would be that intermediate or a journeyman level. And this level typically presumes that you've won some sort of accolade or award at the novice level, or that you've had multiple years of experience, like so more than the one or two year threshold. Um, the people who you would expect to find at the intermediate and journeyman levels are folks who have some experience with competitions Sure, you will get people who enter for their very first competition in an intermediate or journeyman level. Um, it's unusual, but it, it does happen. This level tends to be the most populated entry category. And that's because a, this is where if you've been in enough competitions, you will get to intermediate journeyman. At some point, you will level up, whether it's through years of experience, or you feel comfortable and confident, or you've won something at novice, and now you're in the intermediate journeyman level. And this is where a lot of folks tend to stay. Now, some folks will stay in the novice division because they're a little bit feeling like, oh, no, I like to do, I like to keep casual, or like, oh, I'm not, I don't want to call myself a journeyman until I've won something or I've hit this threshold. Because in reality, the only people who are really labeling you are yourself. Um, many folks tend to want to stay at the journeyman level because the next level is the master's level and that tends to be the highest level of any um, competition that you can do. And that can feel scary. Unfortunately, I have been both a competitor and a judge at competitions where there have been so many journeymen who should have been masters, but they let their own self-doubts get in the way of acknowledging their skill, their talent, and indicating on a stupid form that they are masters. There have been so many instances where I've gone to competitions and seen master quality work. And when I've asked like, oh, what category are you competing in? And they tell me journeyman, my heart sinks a little because I'm like, but why? This is amazing. You should really value yourself. That's my personal little hill that I will die on and I apologize for nothing. <laughs> so anyway, we were talking about masters. So the masters category would be, as I said, that highest level. This is uh, this usually is you've won uh, at the journeyman level. Some competitions require that you've won either several journeyman level awards in order to get to this level. Some competitions require that you've won best in the journeyman category in order to qualify as a master. Some competitions don't even care. Some competitions will indicate that the master's level is specifically for um, folks who have won and also if you're a professional costumer like this is what you get paid to do you take commissions etc cetera, etc cetera. 
again, this is all kind of relative. So categorizing yourself is really based on arbitrary rules that no one's really going to follow up on. Um, like I entered my master, I entered as a master the year I literally, it was like my first year at a competition. I was a, I entered as a novice, even though I'd been sewing a lot. My second year I entered as a journeyman and in both years I won something. So by my third year, I was like, you know what? I do this professionally. I've won something. I'm just going to call myself a master. And then once you've, once you've actually won something at the master's level, all competitions are like, oh, well, if you've won at a master's level at this con, then whatever. No one's going to give you crap for it. No one's going to tell you like, well, you're not actually a master. And no one's going to like look up your pedigree or your history and be like, you know, it's really what you feel comfortable with and have you hit some of their like very vague criteria. For example, having many years of experience in the field or having participated in many competitions. A lot of time, if you're at the master's level, it's a little bit presumed that you've done a couple of competitions before. So I would recommend not jumping in with both feet and like immediately starting in the master's category if you've never done a cosplay contest before, just because um, it's good to get that kind of experience. This category tends to be the least populated. And I do think a lot of it comes down to people not wanting to acknowledge their skill and talent or not wanting to compete against the big dogs. But in the reality, there's so many. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell people who are viewing, there are so many amazing and talented cosplayers who sell themselves short. Let's talk about that. So once you've kind of figured out your category, whether you decide that you're going to be that journeyman or whether you decide you're going for masters or whether, you know what, you're new to this, let's be a beginner. Um, many cosplay contests will have an application ahead of time. This is just so that they can, um, the judges can organize ahead of time or they can limit how many participants so they don't get too many uh, because that does happen, especially at larger conventions. Uh, some of these applications are to take the hundreds or thousands, if it's a big enough con, like a San Diego Comic-Con, and narrow it down to a select amount that would be reasonable to be judged. So that usually comes with a couple of like, you know, mandatory questions like, what's your cosplay name if you got one? What's your character name? Uh, what, is, what is it from? And then, as you can see on the bottom, it says, describe the costume and its construction. Don't be brave. If you don't have characters in it, go nuts. This is where I really, like, when it comes to these applications, I'm like, always tell your best story. Remember that slide a couple things back where we talked about, like, unusual materials, jack-of-all-trades, impeccable work that's where you figure out what you want to hone in on and hone in on it if you want to prove to a uh, pre-application that you are the jack of all trades and your costume should be heard because look at all the crazy skills that you did this is your chance to put it down because in a pre-application you can write all of this. And you know what? The judges technically have to read it. Um, so especially if there is a pre-judging later, in addition to this application, this is where you can kind of like get that information out ahead of time. So if you don't have enough time to talk about all of your crazy, amazing talent, guess what? you've got words written down for someone to enjoy your crazy amount of talent and refer back to your crazy amount of talent. So I mentioned pre-judging. A lot of the larger sized conventions will do pre-judging. So this might be your Comic-Cons, um, your like Emerald Cities, your New York Comic-Cons, your 
San Diego's, even your Dragon Cons, like bigger conventions tend to do this prejudging situation. If you want to be really impactful, you should consider bringing some materials with you to prejudging because it will only help your case. Because at this point, you are a salesperson and it's really good to just sell yourself well. If it is helpful to you, have an out of body experience and pretend like you're talking about somebody else. Because I know I can say amazing and glorious things about my amazing and glorious talented friends. I tend to have a harder time singing my own praises simply because I'm like, whatever, what I did wasn't that important or that great. But that's like the, the imposter syndrome talking and we all have it and we all have to just get over it. This is, this is where it gives you no fears to be, um, to be shy about it. Like if you did cool wig work, tell us about your wig work. Uh, reference images are really helpful because it is very presumptive to assume that every single judge knows what intellectual property you are cosplaying from. I don't even care if you are cosplaying as Superman, arguably one of the most like iconic images. Nope, bring a reference image. Give me your sources. Tell me what you're after. I will tell you right now, I once went to a cosplay contest and it was like a big and important one. And I was like a little stinker. And I was like, oh, I have a reference image. I, I was dressed as a Pokemon. I was like, oh yeah, I have an, a reference image. And I just pull out a folded piece of paper that was just a picture, like a printout of the Pokemon I was. I did not do well at that cosplay competition because yeah, I showed a single reference image, but it was like, it, it just, it fell flat because I didn't put any heart into it. I certainly didn't. So like, here's the Pokemon inspiration. Here's the design that inspired my design, which was an evolution off this other design. And then here's how I, that effort pays off. So a lot of us cosplayers, especially if you put a lot of effort into your costume, a lot of us cosplayers will assemble like this kind of like guidebook or lookbook to bring to competitions because it is a way to show what's under the hood and showcase certain things that you're extra proud of. Um, on our on screen, you can literally see a pa two pages from a lookbook that I have for Aloy from the video game Horizon Zero Dawn. Again, I'm assuming that the people who are judging my costume have a new idea who Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn is. And you yourself might not know who Aloy from Horizon Zero Dawn is. And that's okay. You should, because it's a great game. But I'm going to assume you don't. And that's okay. So in my lookbook, I included reference images from the game, like a full 360 of the character, so that when somebody looked at me and then looked at the pictures, they could be like, oh, that's the 360. I get it. I see it's a perfect recreation if you're doing a recreation piece. I also did some construction notes in my lookbook because what I wanted to showcase is a picture from the game of like a certain part of the character's armor. And I showcased how I had taken an image, pulled it apart and drawn a topographical map that told me how I was going to assemble layers of foam and thermoplastic to recreate the armor, which is like a detail that I could sit here and try to explain, but it's not going to be as impactful as literally showing, here's the blueprint, here's the full thing all together, here's the different layers all stretched out, and I sandwiched them together all precisely, and I created this final product. So you can see like, here's, here's the my version, here's the game version, and you can make that direct comparison. So that was what these pages were about, was showing that process. As a judge, I've seen people do the same thing for wigs, where they'll show, here's the out of the bag version of the wig, here's some of like the progress pictures, and then 
here's the full thing, or if they don't have a here's the full thing, and they show us like, oh, and here we are. I remember at um, Granite State Comic Con, I saw a person compete as Captain Marvel, and the wig that she was wearing looked really cool, but when you got to see the construction notes, the way that she had constructed the height on that like Carol Danvers faux hawk was so innovative and neat and really, really clean. And I only knew that because that cosplayer had brought a lookbook that I could reference during the prejudging. And that was so helpful to get information from her because she's sitting there telling us in her five to 10 minute slot about all these other aspects of her costume. She didn't even get to the wig part but then I got this lookbook that could answer some questions and even highlight something that maybe she forgot to talk about because of nerves or time. So again, a lookbook is a great idea to help uh, showcase, especially if you're worried that your in-person interview might not go so well, or if you're nervous, or if you just don't like talking about yourself, a lookbook can be very helpful. I'm not saying you have to have one. I certainly have competed in competitions without a lookbook, but it does help. One thing I do like to advise though, if you are gonna give a lookbook, just print something, assemble it in like, you know, one of those presentation things like you got in high school, like those little presentation, uh, not even notebooks, like it's they've got like the, the clear flap and like the nice little back piece and you just like, stick them in with the little brads, get one of those and just leave it with the judges because you want them to have access to it when they talk amongst themselves and start doing their scoring. Because if they can look back at your lookbook with pictures, then they can like have this reference image and be like, oh, right, remember how cool this was? Or like, oh my God, I'm looking through this book and did you realize that they made their prop too? Did you realize what that was made out of? So that it becomes then a conversation uh, enhancer. It's almost like your lookbook then advertises for you while you're gone. So when a judge says like, oh, do you want this back? Your answer should be like, no, I'm all set. Please enjoy. And then you out. <laughs> that's, that's the ideal. That is an ideal. Because again, it will fight for you when you're not there to fight for you. So now let's talk about the actual competition itself. Because many cosplay contests have a performative element baked into their scoring, depending again on the contest itself. As I like to refer to it as, to skit or not to skit? That is the question. Um, anime conventions are so very much about this. Most anime conventions I have attended assume that you're going to do some sort of performance or skit, and that requires things like pre-recording and um, and and some for some competitions you cannot use a microphone. You have to do pre-recording only. Some competitions will let you use a microphone and do live performance, in which case you just have to go to each website and evaluate what they say goes. I've certainly been to competitions where someone thought that they were going to do like a live music performance only to be told, no, only re recordings only. You can record yourself doing the music performance and then get up on stage and lip dub over it or lip sync over it, but you can't do live. I'm not sure exactly why one convention does one and one does the other, it's just the rules of the game. Masquerade, so if it says costume masquerade, that tends to be very encouraging of skits. Generally speaking, Competitions that give you 60 to 90 minutes of on-stage time, those are the ones where if you're thinking about doing a skit, this is a good time to do a skit. And when I say skit, I mean any kind of performance, including like doing a little dance, doing a little number, like any sort of performative is what I refer to as a skit. Um, the other kind would be like a walk-on. So this is more typical for like smaller conventions, or like Comic-Cons, we'll just have you do a walk-on 
and sometimes there'll be an MC who will interview you. Sometimes there won't be. Sometimes they'll just read, usually from your application, they'll read your construction notes, which is why you want to write a novel. That means you get to be on stage for longer because they're reading your stuff. And it means that other people get to hear all the work that went into your costume. Um, things to keep in mind, if you are going to do a skit, and I'm trying to figure out how to say this gently, try not to make your skit boring. Because sometimes when people are given 90 seconds, which feels like nothing, but it's actually is a, a long time to fill on a stage, it can get dry very fast. There are plenty of anime dances that can be done in 30 seconds and give you the same fresh, lively taste that could get very stale after 60, let alone 90 seconds. Because like once you've cycled through your dance routine once, you don't need to cycle through it three or four times because then it's just kind of like, all right, I get it. Go on, goodbye, we're done. It's hard to talk about skits because for the most part, when you're in a costume contest, the priority should be on your costumes. Um, so if you're looking to do skits, it's really only, it's really a good idea to do it in a way that will showcase your costume in its best light. So if you're doing something that require, that means that people don't get to see your costume, it's kind of like, what's the point of the skit? So you always have to think, whatever performance you're doing, how can I showcase my costume in its best light? without being too stale or boring. Um, for the competitions that do allow you to do a performance, uh, the skit aspect may factor into your score or it may be its own separate award, in which case figuring out how to showcase your costume through movement or sound is an art form in and of itself. And that can be a little on the challenging side. I, like I said, I usually try to aim for less is more. Um, and I try to aim for um, making sure that whatever I do on stage embodies the character. Or if the character is not a very well-known character or like a ubiquitous, it's not a Disney princess, a way that can show who the character is really quickly and obviously to anybody. So my parents don't watch anime. So if I were gonna perform as an anime character, I would wanna become an archetype so that even my dad would be able to look at that and be like, I get it. I get that that is a bubbly character or I get that that's a moody character. And if I'm going for a moody character, there's only so much energy you can give for a moody character. So maybe make sure you don't exceed that 30 second time limit. These are just, again, little tweaks and things to help. Another aspect of being on stage is uh, working the MC or working the crowd. And this can do you a lot of favors if you're performing because if performance is part of a cosplay judging uh, rubric, then this gives can help increase your scores. When I say work in the MC, I mean having a good and easy rapport. A lot of times if there's an MC who's interacting with you, they're asking you questions. They're a microphone question, hold the microphone to you. If you give one word answers, it might not be as impactful. And I've certainly seen plenty of conventions where amazing cosplayers with beautiful costumes have just given one word rigid answers and then the MC just feels disappointed. And the audience by extension feels disappointed because they don't get to enjoy everything that you have to offer because you have not given them enough to enjoy. So if the MC asks you about your costume, feel free to just tell them about your costume. Like if, if the MC cracks a joke with you, feel free to crack a joke back. It is hard because a lot of that is just like reading someone who you may not necessarily know. Cause not, I assume that not everyone knows the MCs that are at these conventions. Am I right? So like having that sort of rapport is a skill in and of itself, but I've seen very successful performers are the ones who tend to think on their feet and can, um, can respond positively with a good joke back. 
if a joke is being made, like it's, a, it's like a tennis slot uh, volley. Then there's the other aspect, which is work in the crowd. And that tends to be my favorite category of like way of performing. And that's where you sort of include the audience in your performance. So it might be if you're going in, in this example, uh, my friend and I were being cutesy little Lolita characters. So of course we were all like, hi, huh, you know, like the cute little like, oh, I didn't see you there. Oh, look at you. Oh, hello. Like that sort of energy and in, involved the crowd. And so it made people want to watch us, which in turn, of course, gave us energy to want to like do stuff for them. And so we were being hammy and campy and fun. And that's great. By all means, do that. I've certainly been in competitions where it was like a, a throat vote or a clap vote. And I've, I've gone in and was like, huh, I can't hear it. Let's hear more. What? Here we go. Like, you know, work, working the crowd is a fun thing to do. It's the audience loves when cosplayers on stage acknowledge them. So feel free to acknowledge. It's fun to have fun. So now you've done your performance and now you're backstage or maybe you're waiting for your performance and you're backstage. This isn't really like a how to up your game moment. This is a moment where you should be looking to make connections with people because I've made my favorite friendships through watching what other people are doing. If people are assembling their costume or putting on their costume, it's a great way to be like, oh, that's how they did it. Or it's like an opportunity to say like, hi, I'm so-and-so, I like your costume, let's talk. I've made amazing friendships backstage from, uh, from competitions. I've certainly learned a lot from people from competitions because of course this is the, the moment where you can talk to someone who's just as nervous as you are. As a point of interest, uh, in the second image, you see a lot of folks just lined up. This is literally like right behind a stage. I have led so many people on my favorite like way to get out of feeling nervous right before you get on stage. I, um, I sing a song. It's not, not a very difficult song. It's the theme song from Reading Rainbow. I don't know why that makes me feel better. But like, I'll start kind of saying it to myself and then it'll catch on. And I've had people say like, wait, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm nervous. So I'm going to sing, I'm singing the Reading Rainbow song. And then I've had people be like, wait, what? And I'm like, no, it, it seriously helps me get rid of the jitters. And the last competition I participated in, I got an entire row of people to join me in singing this stupid song. It's so catchy. Um, but it does, it makes you feel better because the butterflies in the sky that you can fly twice as high, those butterflies were in your stomach and now they're gone. And now you just feel better because LeVar Burton makes everyone feel better. Just backstage, this is just generally a good tip for if you're feeling nervous. After the competition, do not yeet right away if you can help it because this is a great opportunity for you to meet your judges who are often very talented people in and of themselves. This is not the moment to be like, hey, how come you didn't pick me? This is a moment to be gracious. Thank you so much for your time. How can I follow you? If you're interested in following them, this is where you can congratulate the people who did win and ask how you can follow them on social media because the connections you can make after a competition are incredible. And you can always improve your craft by reaching out to these other experts who might know a thing or two that you don't know. And conversely, you might know a thing or two that they don't know. So after a competition is always my favorite time because that's when everyone's got endorphins and you can tell them like, I loved your work, congratulations. I want to know more. Can I please follow you? Again, I met a lot of friends. Actually, like everyone in this lineup, I keep in touch with because after the competition, I was like, can I learn more about what you've done? So let's get on to some major takeaways, shall we? So I have a couple of major takeaways for you to leave with today. And the first one is to be honest. 
if you are presenting your costume, always tell the judges what you did, which is to say, don't lie. If you didn't make something, don't lie and say you did. That's, I've had situations where as a judge, I've watched as someone told me like, oh yeah, I made this leather armor. And I was like, oh cool, can you tell me about the kinds of leather you chose or how you got the texture in? And the guy was just like, oh, I just did it. And that was like my first tip off. Like, I think maybe this guy might be lying to me because most leather workers will tell the process. This is where I'm bringing my own schema. Like, I know what goes into leather making. I'm wondering if this guy knows what goes into leather making. And if that person doesn't, even if they don't know the terms and can talk around it, like this person's reluctant to tell me kind of gives me the thinking that maybe they're not being honest. So always be honest. Always be your own hype man. And as I've said before, if you are at a judging and you are having a hard time talking about yourself, just imagine you're talking about one of your friends because you can always hype your friend. That's what wingmen are for. So be your own hype man because this is not the time to be shy. This is the time where you show off that you're an expert. Next, always be gracious. Even if you did not win, be gracious. Nobody likes a sore loser. Nobody likes a salty person. Don't be that person who comes around and is just like, so-and-so shouldn't have won. Because first of all, that's mean. And second of all, you don't know who is listening, who might be like, wow, that's a mood. Or like, what are you up to? Like that kind of can like backfire on you. And it can also just make people feel bad. Like you don't want someone who did win to think that you are just trashing them. Like that, that's mean. Or if you did win and you're being a jerk about it, the people who didn't win might feel even worse. So just be gracious. Be positive. Talk about the things you did make. Learn from my fail. Don't tell people what you didn't make only share what you want known. This is not the time to tell me. As a judge, I wanted it to be like this, but then it screwed up. Or like, well, on my way here, uh, the prop broke. So I had to, nope, I don't want to know. I don't want to know. Then, 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 then. Tell me what worked. Tell me what you want me to know. Don't bother telling me what didn't work the way you wanted or how you wanted to have wings and it didn't have wings because I won't care that it didn't have wings. I just care about what I see and then what I hear. <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but again, these are things to think about. So now is the time where I am going to open up the floor to questions that you might have. Now, here's where if you wish to ask a question, you can do it in a couple of ways. You can put your question up on the chat and I will then read your question and answer it. If you are comfortable uh, having your voice or visage on screen, then you can um, unmute yourself and ask your question. This is your time to get any specific information done. So I'm giving you the floor. This is my gesturing the floor hands. It actually looks really cool on camera. I'm doing this while I stall for people to ask questions. I feel like I'm mystic. Oh, I've got a question. Or maybe it's just a chat saying that's great. Okay, so the first question is, have you ever seen a prop break on stage? Yes, and I've seen not only props break on stage, I have also seen costumes fall apart on stage. It is kind of tough when that happens. This is where if you had a prejudging, Prejudging tends to be your friend because I've had, I've seen like in the case where the um, costume kind of broke on stage, the, the costume competition had done a prejudging and gone through their results already. And so the actual stage presentation didn't really factor into the, um, into the decision making. It was more like that was the way the audience could see and participate. So it was more of a walk-on. 
And I saw, I saw this wonderful cosplayer dressed up as Honey Lemon from Big Hero 6. And like she had a beautiful like um, uh, bandolier of the balls that Honey Lemon does the chemistry with. And like they kept popping off and they weren't supposed to and they were like rolling all over stage. And the girl felt really bad. She looked amazing though. And she actually did really well. But, you know, that was, it, it, it can be hard emotionally. When that does happen, the best thing you could do is move straight forward and not stop smiling. Just like pretend it was supposed to be that way or just like don't acknowledge it. Just like keep on having a good time because if the audience sees that you're uncomfortable, it's gonna make you feel more uncomfortable. I know from experience. Um, in the case where props break and performance is uh, assessed, yeah, that might be something that some judges might care about, some don't. It's really, at that point, it's really like, it's dependent on what kind of competition you're in. Are you in a competition where your performance and walk-on matters? Or are you in one where the pre-judging is like the actual show? That's the actual thing you have to worry about. Can I take more questions? Choo -choo -choo. Um, ooh, great question. Do you take into account body and face paint, especially if it's elaborate? And how does that factor into the costume and entry as a whole? That's a fantastic question. Yes, is the short answer. And the long answer is yes. No, I'm just kidding. The long answer is that um, body makeup is another aspect of a costume that if you are doing sewing and armor and you have body makeup, that would put you in what I consider that jack of all trades category. If you have impeccable makeup, that is something you need to focus on. And I actually had a wonderful conversation with a fellow cosplayer who was competing where she was talking to me about her costume and she wanted some thoughts about what I thought she should highlight. And I was like, listen, you do an amazing body paint, like face, like it's an unusual color. You do a lot of contouring. It takes a long time. You're creating art every time you need to cosplay this character. So like, you should be showing that. You should be telling the judges like, yes, and then it takes me this long to get into makeup or like, this is the process. And yeah, you should be taking credit for it because unlike a costume where you've done the prep work in advance, there is a special, um, there really is something special about that which is temporary or ephemeral. Like, makeup is one of those things where it doesn't just happen. This is not an accident. Um, and so for my costume right now, I don't think I would really claim credit for this. I'd claim credit for the fact that like I resin cast my own gems, but that would be like such an aside piece because it's not to me the focal point. But if, so, if a judge asked me like, well, how long does it take you to get into makeup? I would say like, takes me an hour because I have to do the following things to get this ombre and to do this or that thing. So that's a moment where you can highlight. If you were doing like a full like Steven Universe crystal gem body paint or like you were Starfire from Teen Titans body paint, like yeah, I would definitely give that a lot of high marks. So we have about another like four minutes. So I think that's time to answer at least one or two more questions if you have it. Um, and then I will just, so while you're doing that, I'm, I am just going to um, put up my, my little like keep in touch uh, info here um, just so that you guys can see my contact info. So if you do want to follow me or ask some questions that you maybe forgot about or just want to like talk about cosplay in general because I'm a nerd for this stuff and I will always talk about it and I love meeting people. Here's how you can follow me and ask more questions, but I'm free to take a couple, like maybe one or two more questions. If you got it, unmute yourself or throw it down in the chat. I'll just keep doing hand jives. 
while I wait for your questions. I feel like a vampire, or like a psychic. Ask me a question. I look so dumb doing this, so you should ask. <laughs> oh good, I got a question. Um, what was my favorite cosplay to enter and why? I like to enter cutesy cosplays because I find it's a lot easier for me to work a crowd with a cutesy cosplay. Um, I think given that, I think um, my Weepin' Bell costume, which is a visual pun of Weepin' Bell the Pokemon and Bell from Beauty and the Beast, that's a lot of fun because it's a pun and when I get up on stage and people get the pun, you can like hear the beat and then when the audience gets it, it's just like a fun moment. Um, I love those kinds of things. I just love being like flirty and silly and stupid. Like that's my favorite thing to do on stage. But um, I'm also here for just being, you know, I, I do enjoy being like a BAMF, just like pummeling up on stage as some sort of warrior type and just striking a stoic pose. That always feels good. But um, I don't get as much audience interaction from it because it's really hard to be stoic and also be like, yeah, audience, come on in, join this party, because you have to like have a character. Um, so on that, I believe we are just about out of time. I want to end a little early just because I know that exactly at 7.30, the next panel is starting. So, hey, girl, hey. Hi. I'm still on stage. Get out of here. <laughs> Get out of here. Um, so, um, thank you guys so much for uh, coming to this panel. Thank you so much for being a part of WebCon. I really hope that you've enjoyed your panel. I hope you've enjoyed anything here. Please, please feel free to follow me on the face space, the Instagram, uh, the Twitters, the Patreons, whatever. Email me if you have any questions. And uh, with that, I say, goodbye, everybody! <laughs>